Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Today on the show, we have veteran music producer Chris Stevens. What I like about Chris is not only the fact that he has four Grammy Awards to his name and also countless Dove Awards, he's a man of many musical genres, which is something that we talk a lot about on the show, how the industry's heading towards a direction where musical genre lines are disappearing faster than we can notice them disappearing. And he's going to talk about switching from video game music to contemporary Christian music, working with artists like Toby Mac, to now working in country on artists like Blake Shelton, Carrie Underwood, and many more. He also talks a little bit about what working with Gloria Gaynor recently has been like. She, in case you guys don't know out there, is the hit legend artist behind I Will Survive. So we get to hear a little bit about that. But before we dive into the interview, Music Makers Boot Camp is selling out very fast. A few spots left. The VIP spots are already sold out, and the rest are going quickly. So here's a quick message about the upcoming Music Makers Boot Camp. Are you an aspiring artist, producer, or songwriter? Have you ever wanted to break into the music business but didn't know where to start? Would you be interested in spending a weekend with some of the leaders in the industry? Well, here is your opportunity. It's called the Music Makers Boot Camp, and it's happening January 25th through 28th live in Franklin, Tennessee. It's going to be happening at the legendary Sound Kitchen Studios, where records like Taylor Swift, Paramore, Keith Urban, Bruce Springsteen, and many more have been made. You'll be learning in these rooms where multi-platinum songs have come to life. And we'll be bringing in some of the best and the brightest who are doing it every day to share their wisdom, knowledge, and experience. This is a great opportunity for you to take your music production, songwriting, or artistry skills to the next level. The music industry doesn't have to be some big secret. Me and the other coaches really want to share what we are doing with you. Come and learn it with us. Registration is now open at FullCircleGoesLive.com. Again, that's FullCircleGoesLive.com. It's limited to only 40 spots, so get yours now. These sell out quick, so don't miss your chance. I'll see you there. And the last one was such a blast. I feel like I've gotten countless messages from people that have come saying things like, it was life-changing, it was eye-opening, it was inspiring, it was the motivation that I needed to get back because a lot of the people, a lot of our listeners out there from, you know, small towns, maybe not living in Nashville, maybe not living in Los Angeles or New York or a big creativity epicenter. So it's really important for us to come together at events just like these to encourage each other to regain inspiration. It's like we say all the time that iron sharpens iron. If you're in a small town, you may be the big fish in a small pond. I'm going to raise the idea that it's best to be the small fish in a big pond. It's a lot harder and it takes a lot thicker skin, but it makes you a heck of a lot better. So that's why I love events like these, Music Makers Boot Camp. If you haven't already checked it out, make sure you get your spot for it. They are truly powerful events, not just because of the speakers that are there, but I think a big chunk of the value is realized in just the connections and the relationships that you'll you'll meet and that you'll make. And people have already struck up collaborations and co-writing relationships and mentorship relationships as a result of the last boot camp that we did. So I can only imagine how much better the next one's going to be. So don't miss out. But for now, let's jump right into the interview. Here in the studio, we've got Seth Mosley here. We've got my co-host in the co-pilot seat. How's it going? X O'Connor. Good to see you guys. And we have with us, we are very privileged to have with us, the four-time Grammy winner in-house, in person, the man, the myth, the legend, Chris Stevens. I love that. (laughs) It's got a nice (laughs) ring to it. Thank you, Seth. It's good to be here. Man, thanks so much for taking the time to come over. We, uh, We need to hang out more. I, that's for sure we do you're just i can't keep up with you man oh well <laughs> likewise like you're you're like riding on boats and cruising around the lake and like the, i think it's the last show. <laughs> the last time i heard your name um matt hammett who works works with us 
and writes with oh, us. Yeah. Said, yep. "Hey, Chris just <laughs> drove up on his boat and borrowed a microphone." <laughs> I was like, "What?" Oh man, <laughs> I'm so thankful that he had <clears throat> that he had a little spot out there and had a microphone handy because it saved my butt. <laughs> Only in Nashville can yeah. you be on a lake. <laughs> so true. Exactly. <laughs> we were laughing about that forever. <clears throat> it's be, just you can so... be on a lake and be like, okay, there's a. I know a guy staying right there. That's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> I was He's right. got gear. We'll get it done. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> I was right with two other guys, and they were fishing. <clears throat> and I looked in my bag, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I forgot my mic. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I don't have my mic. I've got everything else because I bring a little rig out there, and, yeah. um, uh, and they, they people love it just to get out in nature and to write is awesome but uh i in, in my haste i forgot my mic and um and it just my my head started spinning i'm like okay what's what who do, who do i know and then it just hit me that matt is staying right literally right there on the, it was just across the lake just on the other side on the other shore in a large you know motorhome and i thought i wonder if he's got a mic so I started frantically texting him, and it took about ten minutes, and uh, and then he hit me back, and he goes, "Yeah, come on over." <laughs> you could do, so, you know, you could do like a whole recording studio on the water. Like one boat would be the drums, and one boat would be the vocal booth. <laughs> Another one could be the utility yes, guy. Yes, it's funny. You have <clears throat> almost zero reflections out there, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't really have. Not a live room. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's an interesting. It's an space. ISO booth, yeah. basically. <laughs> it really is. It's interesting. There's just no, uh, especially if you get out in the middle of the, the lake. You know, there might be some distant echoes, but they don't really get picked up. So it's very, it's very dry yeah. sound. You know, the only I- issue is you're going to have probably some guy in a midlife crisis speedboat zipping by <laughs> at sixty miles an hour. But other than that, it's good. <laughs> so. I just, I mean, I've known you for a little while. You've been in Nashville how long now? It's going to be 12 years in December. 12 years. It's hard to believe, but. Crazy. Yeah. So I, I'd love to just kind of hear your story. How, how did you get into music? How did you get to Nashville? Mm-hmm. How'd you get into CCM? How far back do you want to go? I want to go all the way back. <laughs> okay. I want to go back to your great, great. Do you do Ancestry.com? Yeah. I do. <laughs> I sure do. I want to go. to go pull it off. I want to go back to your mill working grandfather. <laughs> there's obviously, I think in all of us, there's some, we go deep enough, there's music uh, uh, in, in our blood, you know, and uh, I don't know that there's anything too terribly, you know, crazy in, in that regard, but there's definitely some musicians in my family. Um, probably most notable would be my dad uh, was a very accomplished singer uh, when he was a younger man. This would have been probably in the like the 40s and 50s. He passed away in uh, late 2012, but was I sang at all the family weddings and was just a very like just just had a velvet voice mm. and um, and you know I think we all as kids I have I'm the youngest of six and uh, we all wow. kind of grew up with music in the house and I in particular I had I'm just so thankful. Um, but God blessed me with older siblings that loved music, and they loved all kinds of music. It was very broad range, most in the pop realm at the time, which mm-hmm. for me, and I'm dating myself, but my most impressionable age musically was probably from the age of maybe five or six to 14, mm-hmm. you know, and that would have been basically the late 70s, early 80s. So... But they all had their record players and whatnot, and they would just crank Earth, Wind, and Fire, Casey and the Sunshine Band. That was in the more like the '70s stuff. And then I had a brother that liked Pink Floyd and oh, yeah. and and Led Zeppelin, and so there was all these different you know things going on. And then I, my oldest sister really loved Christian music, and she played a lot of some of the earlier. Christian music, Keith Green, to name one. I can't. I'm trying to think of the <laughs> of the others, but I listened to a lot of that stuff, and um, it really made it. It really kind of uh, formulated my musical palette, you know, and what what I draw from at a pretty early age. But then I, I you know, I, I did the whole uh, going through high school and whatnot, and being in. Uh, I was in choir and band and all those different things and. 
uh, all the art side of th things. Did well, enjoyed that, and loved music. Um, and then I started at probably around the age of 15. I, I remember vividly going to the Radio Shack in my hometown of Eugene, Oregon. So I saw this synthesizer, and I, I didn't really, I kind of maybe heard about them or mm -hmm. maybe heard something in a song that, well, what is that, you know? And it was marked down, it was half off. And it was, uh, you know, Radio Shack had their own brand, Realistic. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but it was always just basically repackaged something else. And this, in, in this case, it was a Moog. MG1, which was some one of their first, like, you know, little kind of consumer synths. I started playing around with that, and I couldn't leave the store. I was probably, if I had to guess, I was probably closer to 13 or 14, probably 14. My dad worked at the railroad. He didn't have a, a large income, especially with six kids. So it was, you know, it was a, we, we didn't have, uh, we, I couldn't just call my dad up and say hey i, I want to buy this thing you know, and i didn't have any money so but i talked him into it i just said i love this thing i said this is just and they were all always my parents were very supportive of the arts and, and of me pursuing music and they knew i loved music and so i ended up buying this this synth and i just i remember just devouring it just being so into just what it could do and uh, i learned so much really on my own on uh, you know about you know about synthesizer architecture mm -hmm. um lfos and all the all the acronyms that y you associate with synthesizers i really learned just from that little thing yeah. you know and um so that was really a, a a turning point for me in terms of the technology side of what we do at a pretty young age and um got more and more into it and uh, i played drums quite a bit that was kind of my my main instrument um, took a lot of drum lessons, and during that time, but it, it was—I think it was the synthesizer that really kind of just blew me away. So then I started doing this thing where I, I again, we—you know—I didn't have—we didn't have a lot of money, so I would have to sell something to buy something else. So yeah. I'd sell that. Regrettably, I actually ended up buying one just on eBay recently because. Yeah. Just, just in homage of of the. I was going to you know, ask, do you have the original? I, I don't have that one, but I do have that model. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes, I bought that model about a year ago, and it was so. It was literally like days, like going back in time yeah. just to to play that thing. And is it awful or is it the sliders? Great? It's actually really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not. I mean, sonically, it's very in line with um, a mini Moog, but just way more pared down, yeah, way yeah. fewer uh, options and routing and. Um, might be a little thinner on the tone, yeah. but it's not that it's, you can tell it's a cousin of, of yeah. that, you know, that's just got that analog thing, you know? Yeah. But, um, I started just acquiring slowly over my teen years, these little devices, a drum machine here. And then I bought my first hardware sequencer and started connecting them with MIDI cables. And MIDI was pretty young at that, that you know, MIDI basically was the, the way to connect all these hardware devices and get them to talk to each other. And, yeah. This and, is high school still? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in this a while. <laughs> That's pretty I'm awesome. 48 That's great. now. So. <laughs> no, I'm I'm more amazed that you were messing with MIDI sequencing oh, yeah. in high school. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. When MIDI was born, I latched onto it in a big way. I can remember so many vivid memories of going to the music store and drooling over a DX7. Yeah. And it was $2,000. Oh, wow. And I was like, gosh, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to afford one of those. Just things like that that just I'd get so giddy and excited about that stuff. I'm probably going way too slow here, but basically, <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. You're good. It's been just uh, a journey, you know. And um, I, I joined a rock band, toured around the Northwest with them when I was about 18. Did that for a couple of years, and then I met my now wife Nancy, and uh, we started dating. And things got serious, and I was like, okay, I, I'm going to need to go to college. And I'm going to need to stop working in the music field because I just didn't see the possibility of having a a reasonable income and being able to raise a family and that yeah. sort of thing. And it just it just kind of hit me. This is going to be a hobby. It's okay. I'm going to uh, make the best of it, but it's not going to be my career. And so I went into uh, I started going to college and just taking uh, just basic courses and whatever I thought could maybe translate into some sort of an engineering degree or something that might involve electronics because mm -hmm. I, I really did have an interest in electronics. 
not really knowing what yeah. what the future was going to be. And then um, the night before my wedding day, which was June 30th, 1990, I was 22 years old. <clears throat> got married pretty young. Yeah. And I got a job offer. It was a temporary job at a company called Dynamics with an X. And they were in my hometown. Okay. A colleague, a friend of mine, another musician, referred me to the job. It was a summer internship. They were a game company, software company that made games, mainly for the PC. Okay. They hired me with, I had very little experience other than just my little lab at home uh, to do uh, sound effects for, for games. I didn't know what anything about computers on at that point, really, uh, as it relates to you know audio and that sort of thing. But yeah. computers were just starting to kind of really become a viable way of, of making music and, and actually recording audio into a computer was just really get, getting started then. Interestingly enough, that job, which was initially going to be just a summer internship, it really was a, a, an amazing paid education for uh, an intro into music technology in, in many ways the way we, we use it now, yeah, just in, but in its infancy. And so I was very fortunate to have that, that gig, and it lasted you know two or three months. And then by the end of the summer, they said, hey, uh, I said, well, I got to go back to call. You know, I've got to go back into school. And they said, well, we're going to offer you a job if, if you're interested. Offered me a job with a, a salary that was very much in line with what I would have expected when I got out of college and benefits in my hometown. And I was like, okay. So it really just was kind of a, why would you say no to this? Yeah. Because it really, it was also just such a great honestly an education because the guy that i worked with that worked under was very knowledgeable in and i'm not sure how or why because it was such an early stage but very knowledgeable in software as it relates to audio uh, and all these alchemy and all these mm -hmm. things that were just coming out that were new to there was this have you heard of this thing called i think it was called max or something or it was uh -oh. some kind of an algorithmic music composition software i can't, I can't I can't remember what it was called, but it was an Apple-based yeah. crazy. You could route all these crazy things, and he was just so deep into that. I haven't heard of it. I was going to say, we use Alchemy, but that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how right. many years later. It's, yeah. a, it's a software instrument in Logic well, this was now. 1990. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. And so anyway, I took the job. I, I, I never finished college. Maybe I will someday, but uh, I definitely don't regret it. It was um, I worked there for about five years, and then I started my own company, working for them as a contractor. And then also I, I picked up a few other clients, namely uh, Sony, uh, Sega at the time, yeah. and um, Electronic Arts, and eventually Vivendi Universal, which bought out Dynamics. So I ended up doing a lot of composition Very cool. for PC titles in the 90s. And then around 2000, by that time I had a pretty good home studio, um, the technology had transitioned from sound card based mm -hmm. audio to yeah. CD audio. So they were actually streaming audio tracks off CDs, CD ROMs mm -hmm. for, which would eventually become DVD ROMs yeah. for these games. So I could bring in musicians, I could bring in a guitar player and a drummer. And so I, I really started getting more into production as we know it. I, I want to peek into that process was that just you sitting in a room like you're programming the drums and then you're adding the bass and then you're doing you're making entire music beds just yourself so this is no no outside musicians prior to this initially yes yes exactly and would i have played any of those games you know um, i get asked that occasionally and i actually literally have to think about it because i was so interestingly enough i was so not into the gaming culture yeah. i didn't know half the games i put music to like they would just say they would just I say, say i guarantee you i've played one i'm sure i've okay. played way, them. <laughs> way in the games. okay if i go way back <clears throat> there was a game called tribes oh yeah i played tribes yeah it was like yeah capture the point mm -hmm. kind of thing oh yeah i, I don't think tribes. i played that one uh, i absolutely did um i play i i did the programming for one of the versions of a game called siphon filter oh, was, i played I think, siphon filter as well maybe version three or something i didn't do the initial one but I did a lot of NBA titles for Sony 989 Sports, uh, MLB. 
I did, uh, if I'm thinking, if I'm going way back, like early 90s, there was a game called Stellar 7. I did the music for that. I don't remember I don't that think one. I played that one. <laughs> there was a game called... Um, did you do NBA Jam by chance? I did one of the NBAs. NBA Jam was my yeah was my it's, jam. It's, yeah. it's a bread and butter, right? There. I don't Come think on. I did NBA Jam, but I think well, I did about fifty or sixty titles, so I don't remember all of them. But and did you know what you were working on at the time, or were they just like, "Hey, we just need these kinds of things. That's it. Just give them to us. We're going to put we them need, wherever we, we want. We need a fifty cues of. We need some rock music. We need some like heavy rock driving rock music. We need a, you know, it, it was all over the map. Really, okay. I mean anything whatever whatever the scene called for but a lot of it was driving kind of rock stuff and i had a cool. guy in town named joe weber that was a shredding guitar player and it just happened to be in my hometown and just like he would just come in and just knock out these he'd bring his marshall 800 head and <laughs> we would just literally like mic it up and go to town and he was so good it was like just you know just it was awesome awesome but yeah, so that that was that was a good parlay into yeah kind of what I do now, and, and I remember um, a funny story. So I right around early two thousands, I shifted into I didn't abandon the the game thing, but I really kind of got to where I was like more interested in producing artists and music with lyrics and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, and so I uh, started looking for people. And online, there was a little, there was a few resources at that time. MP3.com was mm -hmm. one, and and uh, so I looked for local talent, and and they would show their little songs. I'd click on them and play them, and one of them was a guy named Paul Wright, and uh, <clears throat> I reached out to Paul, and you know we went back and forth for a while. Eventually, we got together, and he came in, and he was kind of a singer songwriter, sort of urban rap kind of west coast thing mixed with a you know like a jack johnson mixed with sublime mixed with various other things and yeah. we kind of clicked and i did an ep for him he ended up sending that to go t records and uh toby reached out to him and said he really liked what he heard and so paul and i flew out to Nashville. My first <laughs> trip to Nashville was probably in 02. Okay. We came out for uh, the, the the GMA week, the Dove Awards week or whatever, and I was like a, just a fish out of water. I was so, I mean, just, I, you got to understand, I, I lived in Eugene, Oregon my whole life. I hadn't really been anywhere. <laughs> so and, and anything like that was a, a new experience and almost overwhelming, but we can talk about my phobic nature later, but <laughs> <laughs> that can be the uh, podcast number forty-seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, and 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 forty-eight and forty-nine. <laughs> so you come to Nashville, it's two thousand two. You're at GMA Week. Yeah. Are you what? What are you doing? I mean, for a lot of the listeners out there, they may not even know what GMA Week is. because yeah. It doesn't really exist anymore. Correct. So, at that time, yeah, the Gospel Music Association, which puts on the Dove Awards, had a. Um, more or less a week, four or five days devoted to, uh, it was just an industry event that brought, um, you know, people in the music industry together, artists, label people, publishers. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it was a, uh, a networking opportunity, yeah. but there were actually some, you know, lectures and things like that, that were beneficial that I don't know that I attended any of those, yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> but there was a lot of hang time and yeah. getting to know people and, um, that was my first introduction into, you know, just what's going on in this town. And um, and it was really cool. I met some really cool people and, and hit it off. And, uh, you know, and then and then at the same time, Paul introduced me to his friend, which is another guy, another Oregonian guy named Sean McDonald. Okay. And Sean was a singer-songwriter artist that had a really eclectic, really interesting sound. And um, um, we started working together and... Next thing you know, he gets a, an offer from uh, EMI, which is now Capital Christian. Mm -hmm. And so he started getting, you know, and then I started working with him on that project, that album project. So between him and Paul, it was kind of a, a lot of doors open in a short amount of time. Yeah. And then Toby, you know, through Paul, I started working with Toby on his second solo record, which was Welcome to Diverse City. And um, he flew out to Oregon a few times and we wrote together. And uh, 
kind of co-producing those tracks with them and um i learned a lot from from that time with him and i still I still attribute a lot of what i've learned if i've learned anything to toby just uh his work ethic his desire to get things right almost to an obsessed level i guess really admired that about him and i i guess i've I think we all have some of that in us, you know. We all are like a little bit tormented <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by wanting to get it right, you know. And um, I think there's somewhere between that and going with your gut is a, the, is the sweet spot, you know, and and not not second guessing yourself. But it's always that balance of the scales, you know. One is it's just got we got to get this right. We got to spend the next week on this <laughs> until it's still it feels right. Yeah. And Hey, that first thing we did felt really good. Where somewhere in there is it? Because sometimes you do come back around, oh, yeah, full circle. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so Toby was flying out there to write with you and stuff like that. So yeah. what transition do you hear to Nashville? It was honestly Toby. I mean, he was just like, man, I don't say this often to people, but I really think you would do well uh, moving out to Nashville. And I'd never even considered it prior to that. I talked to my wife about it. I mean, at the time we had four boys. Okay. <laughs> we had just had our fourth. So we were we had two little guys and then two that were 10, 12 years old. And uh it was it would have been a really difficult move for us. We knew that, but it, we entertained we just thought, well, let's, you know, let's go out there and check it out. So I brought my wife out, Nancy, and um that was probably I feel like our first visit might have been either early 04 or late 03 or somewhere in that she just wanted to come and check out the schools she met yeah. with a few people at the at the schools and she got a really good really good feeling with about it and a good piece about it so we went back home and put our house on the market i remember we were like okay if if, if our house doesn't sell then that's that's god just saying we're this isn't really meant to be mm-hmm. so and we're for, we're we have peace about that it's fine because we have a lot of family out there i mean yeah. it was a big kind of scary move so yeah and our our house we, we were going to take our house off the market because it was about three months which isn't that long but we were just like eh we're not getting any we're not getting anything here yeah no, nobody's even really looking at it so someone came in and made a full price offer and they were not moving this was really interesting they weren't moving from nashville but they were from nashville they had lived in oregon for a while and it was just crazy we got to talking to them and they were like yeah we're from they were from nashville and so all, we just knew that that was a sign that this was meant to be so yeah we took the plunge moved here in december of 2004 and would you uh, you, yeah. you said toby i guess might have been a big reason for coming do you feel like this was kind of one of my questions for you is did you yeah. have any mentors along the way would you would you consider toby kind of that absolutely I, mean, I would absolutely consider toby a mentor probably my biggest mentor uh, you know beyond that i mean there's been people along the way you know some of which i i probably don't give enough credit to or or can't think of at the moment in my add brain but <laughs> um he's definitely you know one of the biggest mentors in in a lot of areas but yeah. but especially in the creative process yeah yeah and, and you talked about just the perfection but how, how else i mean what what are some of the other things that you've learned from so you've i mean you've worked with him for a long time now yeah yeah what, what are some of the other things that you've learned from from having him as your mentor he's a good example of loyalty <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is something we've talked about over the years that that's something i sometimes need to work on i'm a little flighty <clears throat> but I mean, just just speaking completely outside of the creative world, sure. he's a loyal person. Um, he's had a lot of people in his life, you know, professionally and personally. That um, I mean, I think we all have times and seasons that we go through where things aren't in in sync, or you know, things aren't what we expected them to be. And uh, I think he's got a lot of grace for people in his life. I think he's a, he's a really good example of that. <clears throat> and so that that's something that I, I hope I hope to learn more. I hope to be more like that. And so you know that's that's something that um, I, I admire about him. He's got a good heart, you know, and uh, really believes in you know the power of music 
and bringing people together and uniting people, you know, I mean, that's a big part of his platform, in particular um, when it comes to racial issues, racial divides and things like that, and bringing people of different walks of life together and finding common common ground, you know, and all of that through, you know, a Christ-centered, you know, um, approach, ministry that that's really, you know, it's it's really powerful, I think. Yeah. You know. That's good. So you came down to Nashville 2004. Yep. So you've been here for a while, and in that time you've done a lot of successful projects. You've had four Grammys. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What's that like winning <laughs> four Grammys? It's obviously I'm thrilled, I'm thankful. I'm I'm so blessed. I don't uh interesting thing about those kind of things and i imagine you can relate to this they're fleeting mm-hmm. um it's like what now what you know so but that that's probably an unhealthy that's that's the that's the unhealthy example of how to respond to that uh but to receive an award like that is an honor and it's 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 of course i mean we all that do what we do when we get something like that i mean we're I don't want to say foolish, but not to acknowledge it and and be thankful and be and just 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 soak it in, you know. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is the flip side of that is if you get too wrapped up in what it is and what what it means to you personally, I think for some people it's everything. Yeah. And for others, I think it's it's a it's a good milestone. It's mm-hmm. it's um it's something that you really thankful for yeah but you know the competitive side of all everything we do is it's good and it spurs us on to do great things but it also can be corrosive a little bit if we're not if we don't remain focused on you know just doing our best yeah and those things that come along the way if they come along the way i guess they're little nuggets little reminders you know but the grammy thing was um elusive for a while because i (laughs) <laughs> Toby won a couple of Grammys that that I just narrowly missed for whatever reason, lack of content on um in in on the production side basically you have to have 51% yeah. production and it's based on total running time of the album. So, you know, it, it sometimes you're not quite to that. So you don't get the Grammy, you get the plaque or whatever. So yeah. there was that kind of, man, am I ever going to get a Grammy? Which is ridiculous because there's some people 20 30 years you know there's yeah. there's some amazing artists out there and 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 people in the creative business that deserve multiple grammys that have not received a grammy yet so it's it's in in respect to them it's like i think it's just one of those things that it, it comes when it when you're meant to you know receive that but interestingly enough for me <clears throat> my dad passed away in basically december of 2012 not to go back, keep going back to that, but the timing was interesting. Um, my mom was still very much grieving. They'd been married 62 years. Yeah. But uh, two months later were the were the Grammy Awards. I had a legitimate shot. Yeah. And it was with Toby. I asked my mom if she would like to accompany me to the Grammys. And knowing that it was going to be difficult for her to travel just because she's just, I mean, she was still very much in in a grieving mode yeah. and uh but she 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 mustered up the strength and came sat in the audience with me in the pre-show and we won that's awesome and it was just it was just incredible and uh just to have her there it was a very special moment and she was just real proud because she just oh, i can imagine you know, she just she loved the the fact that i was creative and that uh was having success that was and that meant more to me than anything that she just yeah. it was yeah. a, a bright moment and for in sure. a somewhat of a dark time for her you know but um so that the, those are the that's those when i think of grammys i think of those those things are what the images that pop into my yeah, head for sure and then a year later it's funny that it's just interesting that my <laughs> this all happened right after my dad died it was funny but a year later i took my whole family to the Grammys where they'd never been. My kids had never been. I took all four kids <laughs> and uh, the guy that gives the, you know, hope he doesn't get fired, but <clears throat> gives that gives out the passes. Yeah. Gave me a few extra red carpet stickers for my kids. And 
Oh, that's awesome. We all walked the red carpet. They all got to get dressed up and went to H&M and, yeah, and, got, <laughs> and got their $40 suits or whatever. And yeah. we all, you know, looked all stylish and walked down the red carpet and, uh, and we won two Grammys that year. It was, yeah. it was just a, such a neat weekend, you know, bringing them out and they were, they were proud of their dad and, uh, you know, they got to brag to their friends that they walked the red carpet. So it's just, <laughs> I always connect it to family things like that, that that's where it's like, you know, so yeah. That's I'm great. Thankful. That's awesome, man. So talk about over the last few years and even before we kind of sat down today, you were saying you feel like creatively every few years you just need a little bit of a change. Yeah. Or you need a... It's about a five, six year cycle for me. Yeah. So you've kind of <clears throat> recently been in one of those phases where you've focused a lot of your energy over the past year or two in the country music market. Yes. But uh, it's been a, a year almost to the day that yeah. I, I kind of decided to go and pursue that on more or less a full-time basis yeah. uh, for the time being. Sure. Can you talk about why, you know, what what what, what prompted that switch? Well, there were a, a number of reasons, none of which are negative. Just really, I think for me, creatively, I needed to have a change of scenery and just I guess a, a new challenge. Not not that my existing path wasn't challenging. It's always been challenging and always will be. There's something about when you're a creative person and you're getting older mm -hmm. and there's no denying that. So I think for me it was just, um, it was time. I just felt like it was time to make a change. And maybe even even geographically, not meaning move to a different town, but... I, I decided to get a room, uh, a writing room down on Music Row. I just wanted to experience that. And, and knowing I don't even know how much longer Music Row is going to exist, it's changed so much, but yeah. it's still there and it's still, you know, there's a lot of, there's an energy down there. So I just thought, you know what, I'm going to rent a room down there. And a, a good friend of mine, Mark Bright, um, who's a um, very accomplished producer in his own right and has been, you know, somebody I've, looked up to probably a, definitely another mentor mm -hmm. uh got me a room at um starstruck which yeah. is right down on the row and another good friend of mine scott Hendricks, uh was was really kind of behind me doing that he recommended that i do that um just to just to kind of get down in the mix and get down in the middle of all that yeah for a for a season so i did that in october of last year and um just you know it's interesting not having I mean, I've got a studio here in Franklin, and I've got it's pretty well equipped. But it was kind of nice to just almost not handcuff myself, but but basically get those things out of my, you know, away from my what I do, and just just get in front of a just a basic minimal setup, mm -hmm. and just really kind of focus on because uh, sometimes you can get so caught up in the gear and the twist and the knobs and all that. Just really focus on the craft of songwriting, and got to be around. You know, in addition to the writers that I've written with over the years that are amazing writers, I think it opened up some doors to, to, to some other writers that maybe write with a different process and um, and see how they work and see what what kind of thought process they go through as they're yeah. thinking about this lyric or this, you know, or how to set up this chorus and make it pay off and that sort of thing. So I think it, that's that, that was a lot of why I did it was yeah. just to just to become a better songwriter you yeah. know I, I don't know if, if that's necessarily was was the requ a requirement for me to come become a better songwriter i just think the change was good and, and it happened at the right time you know transitioning into career. a new genre was it difficult at all to move into like you've been writing mainly in like one genre and now moving into a new genre like surrounded by new kinds of writers like was that a tough transition for you or did it feel pretty natural I'd say it felt pretty natural. It wasn't, there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, country, you know, like it or not, has become very, very pop oriented. And, uh, you know, so, so, and a lot of what I've done in Christian music has been in, in the pop realm. So, you know, a lot of programming, heavy um, tracks and melodically it's, it's, it's ventured way more, way more into a pop realm. Um, so it was a bit of an adjustment, yeah. but, um, 
really kind of an it wasn't it, it was a pretty natural adjustment for me. So can you talk about no? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Can you talk about working with artists like Blake Shelton and Carrie Underwood? I mean, that's that's pretty cool, right? You have your name on yes. projects that that they've done. Yes, um, and a little bit on that. Um, yeah. In all fairness, I haven't spent haven't had a lot of hang time with those artists. Yeah, they might even be going Chris who. <laughs> but but I got to work on both of their projects. Um, I got to co-produce on Blake's Red River Blue album, which is a couple albums back, uh, with Scott. And Scott was kind enough to invite me into the production process on one of their songs, and I did a, a, some a little bit of programming and a few other things on a, a few other songs on that project. So what what I can say is that I think I had a new appreciation in that. Uh, and working with Scott for attention to detail, mm -hmm. um, and it, particularly when it comes to vocals, I, I think that I think there's a whole other level that I wasn't quite aware of when it comes to particularly like you guys know what these terms are, but comping a vocal yeah. or tuning a vocal and things like that that um, we do every day. I mean, he just that guy's ears are ridiculous like i would be sitting there on a pre-chorus and we'd have blake's vocal in front of us and he'd be like yeah, i don't know there's something something's something's a little bit ahead of the beat there like it's just not grooving it's not it's not locked in and i'd look at it i'd zoom in i would say gosh i can't i don't know i mean i i don't really hear it but i don't i mean i believe you and i would just and I, I think I, I came to realize how obsessed he was with, um, you know, it had to be just sonically perfect, yeah. you know. And obviously there's all different. There's those that want to capture a mood and a vibe as it is without messing with it. And, um, I mean, I'm sure even Scott in, in, you know, depending on what the song is or what the application is, would want something like that. But yeah. we just... I remember spending quite a bit of time on this one part of this track and going, man, this guy really is, he's hearing something that I'm not. And um, it it made me, I, I think after that, I started really like, because if I listen back to some of my earlier stuff that I worked on, and I mean, there's nothing, it's not a good or bad thing. It's just a growth thing. Yeah. But I'd solo, I solo some of my my vocal tracks, and I'd be like, you know, I'd hear all kinds of things that I just missed, you know. Yeah. And now I kind of look at it like, <laughs> it's this, it's this work of art, <laughs> you know. Like I'll solo that track, and I'll listen from top to bottom. I'll go, okay, is there everything? Is that, is that feel a little rushed right there? Is that, you know, does it, is it just not quite anything? Now I'm listening for is anything that takes you out of the lyric what the what the translation of the lyric the way it's being delivered the, the way it's being sung when i'm comping a vocal now i'm not even listening for is this are they are they perfectly in tune here what's the emotion right here is this the best take for the emotion mm -hmm. if they're a little under the note as you as you and i both know we, we can fix that if yeah. it, even if it needs to be fixed it may not yeah. but if if it's just a, a little distracting pitch wise we'll fix that but is that the best take emotionally? And I think sometimes when we're comping a vocal, we're just listening for, oh, that's the most in tune, or that's the most in time, or that's the most whatever. But now I'm I'm listening more to what's what's the best emotion there, you know? Yeah. I think the Carrie Underwood thing with Mark was um, I basically did all the I did what's called a track build, <laughs> which I guess is sort of an industry term for a glorified programming kind of thing where they give you a basically a demo track mm -hmm. and you just build around it you build a, a, a track to the point where you hit play and it just sounds like a, yeah more or less a finished product and then they take that and figure out what they want to use and keep and then they a lot of times they'll recut you know live instruments over that mm -hmm. and uh you know with mark i mean it was the same thing it's just that attention to detail that i began to really appreciate not that i hadn't been 
aware of it, but I maybe it was just on another level, you yeah. know. Um, and those guys are, you know, they're working on some pretty major, major things. So, and, and I think obviously they, like anything else, it's a competitive world, and their 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 song that song is going to be on the radio, and it's got to stack up, yeah, <clears> you know, sure. to, and you know, it's a pretty large market. The country market's a pretty large market, so you know, there's, they just want that, yeah, you know. <laughs> To work. Good man. Yeah. Yeah. So, what artists are you working with right now? Uh, I'm starting to work on Mandisa's next offering. Okay. And uh, that's that's going great. We've got a new song that we're really excited about. I'm actually working with uh, an artist named Gloria Gaynor. Very cool. What's yeah. that like? It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of an ongoing project, but we met uh, on Twitter. <laughs> interestingly enough there you go she was kind of a fan of some of the stuff i'd done with mandisa in the past and she really wanted to work on a record with me so we went back and forth for a while and eventually she came to um she came to nashville to write and that was about two years ago so we've been kind of just picking away at it a year ago august reed shippen i kind of had him kind of help me um on the project and he assembled a really cool group of session players yeah. from newer guys to old school just this really unique blend of players and we did this kind of motown even a little bit of muscle shoals vibe we recorded it down there at rca studio a and cool. um we did it to tape and it was just awesome and she was she just loved it so we got those tracks and we did an ep but before we released the EP, we decided we wanted to do an LP, or, you know, full length. So <laughs> yeah. we're kind of in the process of redoing that. So it's an ongoing thing, but that should be coming out, um, you know, sometime in in early 2017. So it just takes takes time, you know. Um, yeah, it's sure. a process with her, you know, just figuring out. I got a question for yeah. you. Do you do you think you'll survive? <laughs> <laughs> so far, I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and she sure has. Yeah. She's like unbelievable. She goes all over the the world and plays these huge sellout crowds. It's just amazing. I'll be talking to her. Oh yeah, I've got to go to Dubai next week or what? Like, it's. Just, I'm just like, how do you do it? But she is she's got so much energy and so like. It's just uh, something to shoot for. Singing like and that. She's not slowing like down goodness. either. Like, and she's she's still she's totally has it. Like when she plays live and does a live performance, it's on. I performed with her at the Grammy after party the year before last. Wow! And she invited me up to play keys with her band, and the, her band's killer. And she played right after Jesse J. You know, I'm thinking. Man, there's a lot of energy on this stage right now with Jesse J and you know, great singer and you know, young and just yeah. going for it. I'm I'm wondering what that's gonna be like to follow up with that. Wow. It was that crowd literally was lit up as soon as she came on stage, even before she got on stage. They were pressed up against the stage and they were singing like crazy all the all the all her lyrics and everything and wow. so she just had them in the palm of her hand and I'm like yeah. this is amazing like these people were they were just eating it up and it was uh it was so cool so it was like amazing the, yeah, that well, is awesome. I, I love that and I think that that so resonates with us what 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 we believe in just hearing you you're working on a a Christian record you're working on a Gloria Gaynor record you're working on these country records I I personally love it and that's inspiring for me because I'm such a fan of what's happening right now with genre lines just disappearing yeah. anyway. Yeah. It's all it's well, all music. You, you're a big part of that too. I mean Well, I don't I know feel about like, that, but Well, I mean I mean it's just uh it's it's amazing that and what you're saying is true. It's just that blurring of the lines and there's more and more of that happening. Yeah. And uh I think it's cool to see that genre bending going on i think some people yeah. are probably a little bit taken aback by it but yeah. it's it's uh it's just neat to see that it's yeah. it's like a blend of colors or cultures oh, sure. or you well, know life's too short to just paint the same picture over exactly and over again, so. yeah no it's I true i love it yeah i want to ask you a little bit about because we've talked about some of your mentors i want to ask about you as a mentor because since i've known you and since i've been here i've seen a couple really phenomenally successful producer writers come up i don't know if under you is the right term but with you 
David Garcia being one and Brian Fowler being one more lately. Can you talk about being a mentor and what, what's been the impetus behind that? I'm going to add Jericho to the list. Yeah. <laughs> there you Please go. Please do. I love mentoring. I really do. Like it's, and obviously I'm older than all you guys. So I feel it's my duty a little bit, but it doesn't feel like a duty. It's actually something I really enjoy. Um, and I hope it's even maybe uh, expands beyond the creative realm. But, and interestingly enough, I feel like I get almost equally mentored by these guys <laughs> in some way. It's a, it's a definitely a mutual thing because I, I learn, I learn a lot myself, but the mentoring process I just think is important because there's so many, um, up and coming young, talented people that just need some perspective from someone that's maybe made some mistakes or ha had some success and kind of none of us has the, the the formula to success like the the or at least uh, i should say you know there isn't really a a you do this and you will be successful it's really i think comes down to just hard work and continuing to raise the bar on your own work and what you're doing and um and really good looks that's right yeah right you gotta smell good yeah. <laughs> yes and that's why i've i've been really successful wearing a paper bag over my head all these years <laughs> keep it a mystery no but I, I i love mentoring i'm so happy for uh you know the the small number of folks that i've mentored that have hopefully benefited in some way at least they they, they say they have and they seem to have and that is that means more than anything to me is to see them, you know, do something with what what they've learned, and I'm just thankful to have that opportunity. And when I'm, you know, a lot of mentoring for me is just spending the time and going over the little details. And that, you know, I, I think anybody can get into this business and work hard and at least make some progress over time but when you get a when you get some inside info <laughs> just meaning you know real world situations that we come up with every day troubleshooting how to deal with an artist who's not in the mood to record that day you know maximize the performance you're going to get from them how to know how big the window is going to be before you're going to lose them and how important it is to get the best from them in that time frame all those little things that I don't know a formal education provides. Maybe it does. But the practical, it's great when they, when they can get that from somebody that's, that's had that experience and learn from their own mistakes. It kind of puts them a little more on a, a faster track yeah. to, to excel. And I love to see that, especially when they take, they take stock in it. I mean, there's, there's occasionally the cocky, I don't know if I do it that way, you know. And that's fine if, you know, I mean, I don't, I, everybody has their way of doing it, but obviously maybe this is my ego, but I love it when I, when they soak it in like a sponge and, you know, and Brian is been very much like that. He's just been like, yeah, you know, tell me everything. Don't hold anything back. You know, if I give him a, a song critic, I almost feel bad. You know, and of course I'm, I'm doing that less and less cause he's, he's probably better than me now, but but he, he, you know, early on, he was like just soaking it up. And I'd be like, man, I'm so sorry if, if this sounds harsh, you know. But he'd be like, no, no, just I, I need to hear it. I want to hear it. And he would just take that and just, and, and, and next time around, it'd be that much better. And to see that was like, because I think uh, older generations always look down, look at the younger generations. And they tend to go, not that I'm that much older, but I am. Let's face it, uh, <laughs> and kind of go, yeah, they just don't, you know, the work ethic, the, you know, they, they're just too much entitlement. There's too much this and that, you know. We can get stuck in that rut a little bit, but I'm, I, I really want to, I want to applaud the younger generation for, especially those that, that realize that it is a lot of work and it is, you know, about learning and getting better and being your worst critic and, and all those things not beating yourself up but making sure that you 
it's one thing when your mom says, oh, I love that, you know. <clears throat> oh, man, that's, you're the best. <clears throat> I mean, we hear those, and I, I love my mom for, for always being supportive of what I do. So no offense, mom, but <laughs> when you get real world feedback, somebody yeah. that says, listen, I'm saying this because I love you, and I know this is, this is important to you, you really want to go somewhere with this, so I'm going to give you the honest truth. Yep. That chorus stinks, or, you know, you're just not setting it up right, or you're, the payoff isn't there. It's, it's great all the way up to the end of the chorus, and you just, that's just not, it's not that melody or that lyric is not right. And just, you know, detailed feedback, I think, is, and I just, I love being able to share that. I always preface it with, this is my opinion, mm -hmm. but it's the right one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So you kind of touched a little bit on it, but just real quick, for people just getting into the music industry or thinking about joining the music industry, do you have any tips or any kind of advice that you would give to them? It's a little hard to answer that because I know each person's in a slightly different place mm -hmm. where they're at. Some are literally just waking up today and deciding they want to get into music. Others are in a, on a journey already and they're struggling a little bit. So uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of do some broad stroke stuff. And that is, um, first of all, be thankful for the day that you're in right now that you got that you get to wake up and do something. Mm -hmm. That's the very beginning just be thankful. Gratitude is huge because as creative beings, we tend to be hard on ourselves. We tend to be moody, depressed, anxious, all these things that kind of come with the creative mind. So if you can, if you can at least pause and go, thank God I'm, I'm here, hopefully healthy. And I, I get to do this. I get to experience this journey that I'm on. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of work. And it's not going to happen overnight. Once you kind of set set that tone, then I think it's. Just, and I'm giving this advice to myself as much as anybody else. It's a re, it's a constant reminder. Sure. But then it's just a matter of I think so much of what we do is relationship building, and it's the right kind of relationship building. That meaning, not to say there isn't a lot of cold calling that is, needs to happen. But if you get into a pattern of just cold calling people and I need a gig, I need something, I need your help, I need this, uh, I think if you can if you can balance those out with you know the timing needs to be right for those kind of calls. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you got to believe in what you're capable of learning and doing with just plain old hard work. And thank God we have things like YouTube, mm -hmm. Google, things like that where we can get learn so much online just. You know, and even with Seth and what he's putting out and all these these different sources of information, it's incredible. I mean, what I wouldn't have given to have that, you know. Yeah. So it's out there. The information is there. It's just, you know, you've got to do your homework and you've got to dig in and find out, you know, if this if this is what you're passionate about, then you got to start learning it inside and out. Out of respect for the people that have and have gone on to be successful, they didn't just wake up and go, huh. I'm going to be a world-class engineer. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't happen like that. It's it's yeah. so much about time and effort and learning from your mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. But at the same time, as you're building these relationships, coming back to that part, see if there's something you can bring to the table when you're meeting with these people that you admire, that you think you want to get advice or get something from. Mm -hmm. It's so great if you can... And you may fail the first few times, but if you can bring something to their, you know, yeah. bring something to their life that might help them out. Hey, have you checked out this new software or whatever that I'm, I'm it's, it's pretty cool. You should really check it out. Yeah. And, and it's made a big difference in my mixes or whatever, you know, and suddenly it, it or, or, or asking, uh, you know, once you get to know somebody, asking them about their family or how, you know, or asking them something it doesn't have to do with you needing something from them, you yeah. know, because I, and I think I like, I look at the people that reach out to me and I want to be available for them. I want to be able to help them out as much as possible. Yeah. And that's, that's something I, I'm, I'm working on to, to make sure I make time because I was in their shoes at one time and I got to yeah. remember that. But I, I, I definitely encourage you to look at it a little less like that person has something I want. And 
I'm going to I'm going to go bug them until they till I get a gig from them or something. It's a bit of a just just letting you know, it's a bit of a turn off. Yeah. to that person. Even though they've been in your shoes, there's this it's just such a one-way thing. And if you can t- somehow turn it into a two-way thing, maybe build that relationship a little mm-hmm. bit over time. And it's either going to happen or it's not. And then you go that if that door just remains keeps staying closed, then you go over to this one. Yeah, you know, and 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 eventually you'll, you're going to find the relationships in the little camps that you're meant to be in, and then you'll build each other up that way and and learn from each other. Find people in your local community that that you believe in, mm-hmm. whether it's an artist or a collaborator, a songwriter. And, um, you know, even if they're rough around the edges or they're not quite, you know, maybe by, by spending time with them and, and collaborating with them, you'll learn something from each other and you'll, and you'll get better. So starting in your own community is a great thing. I think a lot of people think, oh, I got to move to Nashville. I got to get in that scene, you know, and yeah. unfortunately a lot of people come here and don't, they, they, they move back, you know, and, yeah. um, I was fortunate that that didn't happen with me, but I expected it to, which is probably not a good attitude, but I actually <laughs> didn't think it was going to happen. But, um, and I think for a lot of people it doesn't. So, um, as long as you're, as long as your, your work ethic is strong and you're, a, and you're, a, I hate to say it be cliche, but a good person, you know, you've got the, the, the you got a good heart, you, you know, and you yeah. want to contribute as much as as receive then i think it's i think you'll you know and just pre- prepare for a long a long journey yeah you know? that's great well, that's phenomenal well chris thank you so much for taking the time to come here today i feel like i just sat through a college class in a, in oh, a very good way yeah well thank we you man go that's... rewind this and listen to it like five times and take <laughs> notes and i'm gonna too <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show. Thanks for joining us here every week. If you haven't already, head over to iTunes, leave us a good rating and a good review. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company, with editing help from Jericho Scroggins. Once again, head over to fullcirclegoeslive.com to get your spot at the Music Makers Boot Camp. It's January 25th through 28th, 2017, right here in Franklin, Tennessee. Fullcirclegoeslive.com, and we will see you next week.